Hey everyone, this is Robert Keynes with goldsilverpros.com. It is Tuesday, August 25th, 2020. And here is today's gold and silver market report. Uh, we're gonna be going over the markets like we normally do, although I'm gonna be adding a wrinkle into today's presentation. I'm going to be bringing you some COT data, which is commitment of traders, which will allow us to break down some of these longs and shorts in a little bit more detail. And this will be important for the series and showing who's going long and who's going short and what their possible motivations are. We'll start off with the gold prices. As we can see, as I'm recording here, we have a 1929 gold. It's down about two cents for the day and 2652 silver. I believe both gold and silver are in raid tra uh, range trades. But let's look at the chart and we'll start with gold. As you can see, it looks to be retracing down to the 1900 mark, which is a previous all time high in 2011. This doesn't surprise me. Remember in previous videos over the last few weeks, I've talked about maybe coming down to 1800. Uh, doing a cup and handle or maybe even down to like the 1670 range, which would be uh, the 200 day moving average little squiggly red line you see here. It's possible to go down to that level. I don't think it'll go down much below 1900, but it could be wrong. We'll have to see what happens in the market. Uh, let's kind of take this down to uh, just the most recent couple of months. And you can see uh, the volume is really thinned out a little bit on the open interest. We've had a little bit less trading here. We've seen a, a, a downward uh, slope and it's mostly red, meaning it's mostly uh, shorts coming in and you can see the price sort of falling over that time period. And you can see it here testing this $1,900 range. It could come down uh, to, the, to the 200 day at about 1800. That's entirely possible. We'll have to see what happens. Now, we won't know really about gold to the bigger uh, picture until December, because as I've said, that's decision month. And that's where there's a ton of open interest, meaning uh, long and shorts in the market, higher than any, any point in time recently, and which we're gonna find out whether the market wants to go net long or net short. Does it want to uh, form that company handle that I've been talking about over and over again over the last month? Potentially, and it could come down. And again, that's majorly bullish if it does. Cup and handle patterns are typically bullish, especially over this type of frame, a time frame for our market. And I think what we're seeing right now is a little bit of exhaustion, in both gold and silver. It really, I mean, you look at this nice uh, curve, but uh, markets don't go straight up or even uh, keep their curves for, for forever. I mean, they have to basically see corrections and some, sometimes get exhausted and just trade sideways for a while until uh, the traders can decide what they want to do. And, uh, you know, looking at a gold open interest coming up in December being really high, I mean, we could, you know, fall back or range trade around here for a couple of months until that happens. Uh, and, and let sort of the, the exhaustion uh, work its way out of the market. That's entirely possible. So uh, don't let it surprise you if it does. We really don't have enough data right now to predict what's going to happen. We'll just have to see what happens. Overall gold, gold volume falling down here on the nice chart uh, that I showed you, uh, same as the, the three month chart I have here. So we'll go back and, and load that chart. Uh, volume falling here. Uh, overall, we see accumulation, accumulation, then it's starting to fall off. Okay, same thing here in this pretty chart. So that again, it's not shorts coming in and hammering down the market. It's just an overall sort of collapse in the gold trade enough so that uh, interest seems to be waning a little bit as we get uh, to the end of this month and into September. And in terms of open interest, September doesn't have very much open interest. So I could see gold drifting down a little bit in September because there's not gonna be a whole lot of physical deliveries there to, to bring it back up. And I don't think there's gonna be a whole lot of new shorts to bring it back down unless that open interest increases during the month. Then it starts to ramp up in October leading up to the big decision month in uh, December. So we go either way with gold. I don't expect it to sharply correct anytime soon given the open interest or sharply move up anytime soon unless something happens in the market to cause people to come in all of a sudden and, and start uh, either bidding up or shorting uh, the contracts in the market. We'll turn to silver here and basically the same thing. You see silver uh, it didn't quite peak at 30, got to about 29, kind of touched on 30 uh, just briefly. Really, it was at the $29 range and then it's fallen down to support here at about the $26 mark. Is support because you see support here in late 2010, support here in late 2011 and support here in mid 2012. Uh, so those support lines were important uh, in the last bull and bear market for silver. And of course, that's what's happening here. It's acting as a support line again. Will it fall back down through uh, 26.7 and retrace and try 24? Let's see what's going on in the short term chart. Will it come back down to 24.5 uh, that we were talking about 
uh, in the July timeframe where it tested once and came back up through? Will it come back down to this line or even fall more? We don't know. We can see the decreasing volume here plus the, the overall bearish position on silver. And you can see it in this chart here, bearish position on, on uh, the overall amount of trades going into silver. So that explains its current price drift. But uh, I think it'd be a little bit different for silver because we have a lot of open interest here in September and notice how we're building interest for December. So this, this may change the narrative slightly. I still think September is the decision month for silver because of the amount of open interest. Um, uh, 122,000 volume and 49,000 open interest for September, but look at the explosion of open interest for December. So we could either see a very sharp retracement in the price of silver in September if the shorts really come in and the longs aren't standing for delivery. Uh, that could bring the price down. Maybe it tries $24, $22 range even. And then maybe it goes up in December. Uh, we'll have to see. I think what happen, whatever happens in September for silver, it may be a predictor of what happens for gold because I think that silver is starting to get a little monetary demand. I think this demand for silver was a combination of people trying to source their silver, their physical silver. Think about it. If you're uh, Apple and you're trying to secure silver and the mines had just shut down due to the economic shutdowns and the supply chain had experienced some problems, you may be going uh, directly to mining companies to secure whatever they may have in their inventories. You may be going to, you know, short of them being shut down and not having it, you may be going to Comex to try to source that. That's probably a lot of what driven this demand since March since we saw the, the economic shutdowns in March. But there's also some monetary demand coming in because look at the gold chart. When gold moves like it has over the last several years, silver usually will come in late and start to rush to catch up. And I think that's what we're seeing in the silver chart. It's rushing to catch up with what gold had been doing basically since 2016, uh, this upward movement here. So I think silver was doing some catch up there from a monetary perspective. So I think there's plenty of demand in silver overall. I'm not too worried about silver crashing down too far. I mean, could it retest 20? Sure. I don't think it'll stay there too far. I think uh, overall, I expect silver uh, to be bullish in September as we look at the open interest, but an even bigger potential trade is forming here in December to go right along with gold. And that's gonna be really interest, interesting to see what happens. Of course, this Thursday uh, will be uh, the first delivery day for September for the markets. So on Friday, we could see some strong uh, delivery notice action come in on silver and we can see a nice boost in price. Same thing with gold, we'll have to see what happens. So we'll definitely talk about that um, as the week ages and, and see what's going on with that market. And I think they'll be really interesting. The first few days, you know, end of this week, early next week may give us an idea of what's gonna happen both in gold and silver, basically looking at the volume, the open interest and how many people are standing for delivery. And we'll show you the delivery reports as well. I don't have them up today because we won't have a whole lot of new deliveries as we end the month. But if we start to see deliveries come in at the very end of this month and beginning of next month would be next week. And then we'll definitely keep you guys apprised of what's going on. Now, I wanted to talk about commitment of traders reports. And this comes out from the CFTC. And commitment of traders basically tells you uh, what who all the longs and shorts are at an aggregate level uh, on trading on the COMEX. So these charts I've been showing you so far is just an aggregated amount of, of data. Uh, but now we're going to break it down into uh, into a tier below into basically who these people are, you know, at, at a, at a bulk level who are, who are making these bets long and short in the market. We still don't have the transactional level data because that would re reside with actually these uh, companies and entities. Uh, it, it wouldn't necessarily be the responsibility of the CFTC to report that. I and mean, these companies and entities, you know, have their private books and they're not going to report that. So we're not going to see on an account by account basis is doing this, but we can see, you know, whether it's a producer or whether it's a swap dealer and I'll define that term here in a moment, you know, whether it's an other category of traders on the market. So let's get into that. Uh, here, there's an open interest position chart, which gives us basically a history dating back to about 2000. And you can see as the gold price has risen, the first observation is the overall amount of interest has risen. And uh, on this middle line here, everything above this is long and uh, everything below this is short. And the red color is commercial, the blue color is non-commercial, and the green is other, or, or I'm sorry, non-reportables. The green is basically the small players in the market. Uh, the small fries who come in and aren't the, don't represent the big bullion banks or the producers or the merchants. The commercial shorts represent the swap dealers, and I'll show you who that is in a moment, plus the producers, they're aggregated. This is called an aggregated report. So you aggregate these two, those two uh, groups together. And the non-commercial are like the managed money or the, a lot of other financial interests. 
who, who enter the market as well, trying to hedge some position or another. So if you're a miner or producer, you're in commercials. If you're a bullion bank, you're in commercials. Uh, most other financial entities are in non-commercials. And then all the small fries are this green, the non-reportables. So interesting to see as the gold price has risen and since 2000, since the tech crisis and of course the financial crisis 2008, 2009, open interest has exploded either side on the gold trade. Uh, same thing with silver as well. And it basically means more people are trading. And as I showed you in last Tuesday's video, they're trading to get the gold off the market because most of it's going to eligible, remember, not registered. And eligible is just safe storage. It doesn't go towards futures contracts. So this is basically what's happening since 2000. People are coming into COMEX and taking and securing their gold. And uh, we see a lot more activity here. As we go down, here's the net positions. Again, this is just another way to look at it. You can see the overall increase in open interest, open interest here in green, and you can see the increase uh, since 2000 of uh, commercials and non-commercial activity. Uh, the commercials are net short and the non-commercials are net long, and I'll explain why that's the case here in a moment. And some other charts that basically explain the same thing. A good site to come to to get that data, and we're gonna break this down even further here in a moment. I wanted to provide one interesting um, look at uh, the concentration of traders in the COTS. Uh, they're, you know, from a short position, it's the big bullion banks that come in here and handle all the shorts. And they're handling shorts because they're handling for all their clients. People go to the bullion banks to do it. And uh, the producers come to the bullion banks to do uh, the shorts in the market. The reason they do shorts is if the price moves down, say you're a silver miner and the price moves down between the time that you're you know, mining the silver to the time you can get it refined and out to the market, which can be, you know, anywhere from 90 to 120 days, uh, the price of silver could fall and you take a short position to capitalize on that. And the price does fall, so you make a little bit of money on that short position, that will offset your loss in the physical market. So a lot of the producers will come in here. A lot of merchants will come in here um, asking for a short or a long, depending on which way the price is going to move. But say they're making TVs and you're Samsung and you're, you're trying to hedge the price movement and the the natural resource input to your product. Um, also, uh, the swaps, as we'll see in a moment, handle the shorts for uh, the GLD and other ETFs to offset the price risk of, of acquiring uh, gold and silver for those ETFs. And we'll talk about that here in a moment. So there tends to be this concentration of the short positions aggregated up to these bullion bank accounts. And so bullion banks make these trades for all these entities. And they also do a little bit of trading for their house accounts as well. And you can see this concentration in silver. Here in red, you have the four largest traders. And in green, you have the eight largest traders. In silver, you see, and this is in days of production. So how many days of production we see across the world? How big is that short position for the four largest traders and the eight largest traders? The four largest bullion banks, the eight largest bullion banks. And silver, it's the highest. It's over 100, about 105 days of production for the four largest traders and 150 days of production for the eight largest traders. That means between producers, swap dealers at all in that category, they're hedging short 150 days worth of production. And those are concentrated in between four and eight uh, entities on the market making those trades for them. So it just shows you the concentration. Notice how the precious metals are three of the four top. You have cocoa and then you have gold, precious metal, platinum, precious metal, silver, precious metal at the top. Now, why would the precious metals be so concentrated in the bullion positions? Well, we're going to get to that as we break down these COT reports, these commitment of trader reports. Um, and there's reasons why, but you'll notice the precious metals have the most concentration in the bullion uh, by the bullion banks over all of these other commodities. Uh, there is a reason for that. There's so much, only so much gold and silver in the world. There's only so much platinum and palladium and one of its resource scarcity. Uh, you, you can't grow more gold or silver or platinum. You can only mine it out of the ground at increasing cost over time as you go from getting the easiest stuff to the less easy stuff. A lot of this other stuff you can grow. And so there tends to be less shorting involved in that because you can simply grow more and increase production, assuming you get good agricultural yield. So that's one of the reasons, although there's going to be some others as well, but that's one of the major ones. Um, I'm going to take you to the actual uh, CFTC.gov website and, and show you what the COT report looks like. It's very, very messy, first of all. You see these very complicated tables. And if I highlight uh, palladium here, this is palladium, and I highlight palladium, you can get these different categories. You get the to total overall open interest here, as you see where I'm highlighting my mouse. And then you got producer, merchant, processor, user, swap dealers, managed money, and other reportables. And, and then it has it broken down in long into short. And there's something called spreading, which basically just shows how many more long or short uh, the average trader is within this category. But it doesn't matter in terms of total numbers. It's just basically a subset of these numbers. And it's showing the spread 
in some of the largest concentrated positions. So we'll ignore that because it really doesn't matter for purposes of our analysis. But I wanted to point out to you what all of this is. And then down here, you have percentage positions. So in palladium, you have 48.8% of the shorters are in the producer category. Now, this is really hard to read. It does have all of the metals in it. What I've done is basically uh, put this into Excel and cleaned it up. So we're looking at gold, as you can see down here on my tab label. This is gold uh, traders report from August 18th, 2020. And I've done the open interest here in green, uh, the producer merchant here in purple, the swap dealer here in brown, the managed money here in green, a little bit of pink or, or peach for the other reportables and then non-reportables. Pretty much for the other and non-reportables, those are the small players in the market. And you can see the numbers are overall smaller, although there is some substantial size. Those guys play the market for their own individual reasons or individual speculators, uh, uh, very wealthy people, stuff like that, who aren't big institutional traders. And so they do matter, but the thing that matters the most are the producer, merchant, swap dealers, and managed money. That's what we pay attention to the most. And I've got that both for gold and silver, same color scheme here for silver, green, and all these other colors. So I try to keep the color scheme uh, consistent between gold and silver. So let's talk about gold first. Now, I said that the commercial positions were broken down into producer, merchant, and swap dealers. So these are commercial positions. And let me actually label that for you here on the chart. This makes up commercial when you add all of this together. So we're going to add our merge cells. We're going to call that commercial. We'll bold that, underline it. That's your commercial. Manage money is non-commercials. Remember, I talked about non-commercials. And then other non-reportables of these categories here. Let's go back and review that on the easier to uh, review charts. Uh, when we go back here to... Uh, this one. So non-reportables here, remember, it's a small traders. Non-commercials the, is the managed money and commercials is the producers plus the swaps. Okay, that makes sense. So this is called a disaggregated report because it, it separates the producer merchants here from the swap dealers, even though they're all in this overall uh, commercial category. If I let's give this a nice little border here so you can kind of do that. And here's your, uh, your non-commercial and here's your others here. So in commercial, they separate producer merchants and swap dealers. And there's something interesting to note here. Producer merchants are, producers are the people that pull it out of the ground and the merchants are the ones that use it. Uh, they have similar needs in the market, so they're grouped together. And then the swap dealers, I said I would explain who they are. I'm actually gonna go back to my browser window and bring up some information on who swap dealers are. Here at uh, doddfrank.com uh, says uh, swap dealers are defined here. And it says the National Futures Association maintains an up-to-date registry of the swap participants. They show that they are currently 94 companies with registration of swap dealers. Almost all the companies are large banking or financial services companies and their affiliates, including Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Citibank, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Credit Suisse, and others. And if you've been following the series, when I go look at the actual metal depository statistics, the actual metal saved on the COMEX, you'll see these names. Why? Because they're trading as swap dealers and they'll take in or let out metal uh, based upon how much they need in the COMEX to off offset some of their futures positions. That's why you'll see these names in two places as swap dealers in this report here and as metal depositor uh, who keep the metal as depositors who keep the metal on the COMEX, if that makes sense. Now, what are swap dealers? So you, we know that they're big banks, but what do they actually do? Well, here is a report from Sunshine Profit. Sunshine is uh, one of the, um, it's basically an analyst within uh, the gold and silver space. And they define swap dealers include financial institutions issuing shares of gold ETFs and hedging the sale of those shares in the futures market. Swap dealers are included in the commercial traders category. Okay, remember we go back to our chart in the commercial traders category. My screen share will let me get up to it. Hold on just a moment. Here we go. In the commercial traders category, this red category here, this is swap dealers, plus um, the producer merchants. Okay, they're included in the commercial traders category in the aggregated version of the COT report. Aggregated is the visual I gave you, the disaggregated is a spreadsheet. And this is why when one adds up all the positions of producers and swap dealers from the disaggregated version, they get the number of commercials. So basically just confirming what I said, I went through all of that defining it so that it would be clear to you and so that we would know it going forward. 
So the, the interesting thing here to note is that overall open interest has fallen a little bit as of August uh, 18th report down by 9,335 contracts. So the interest overall has waned a little bit as we've gotten deeper into the month, which again is why I showed you at the beginning of videos and in open interest wanes, it tends to have a drag on the price because there's gonna be less physical gold deliveries. We saw that in the chart. The producer merchants have changed by uh, reducing their overall shorts, 3,355 contracts. What does that mean? Remember, they'll go short to hedge downward price risk by taking a short in the futures position, which they could recover that money if the, if the actual price of gold had come down to offset their losses when they go to physically sell it. Well, when they're reducing their short position, they're basically saying, we see less risk in this bull market of a price decrease, so we're going to reduce all these short contracts. And they're going net net. Uh, net net, they reduced 700 contracts in longs. So and net net, they're 2,600 up more long than they were before. They're cutting 3,355 shorts. They're cutting 700 longs. Net net, uh, they're 2,600 more long than they were prior to those two moves, if you aggregate those together. Now, the swap dealers have increased their short. Here's the short position. They've increased it almost an equivalent, 2,946 contracts. So most of the, uh, the release of the shorts from the producers has gone to the swap dealers. Uh, why is this important? Because I think it's, it's formulating a short squeeze on the market, making the swap dealers deliver the gold on all these contracts, all these long standing for delivery. So I think the producers and merchants, you remember when I said the last couple of weeks, I've said the producers are coming in or people are coming into the COMEX to try to pull fiscal off the market. Well, who needs it? Well, the producers are, are willing to take it and add it to their stocks, especially in a rising price environment because they can turn around and sell it. And if they believe that the price is suppressed, they can get it cheaper than it's worth, but the merchants especially will need it because they're manufacturing with it. They use gold in jewelry, they use gold in electronics. So there's a short squeeze going on and the producer merchants are kind of ganging up on the swap dealers. The swap dealers, why do they take shorts to begin with? This would take a little bit of explanation. So they take shorts to begin with because uh, they're the ones that uh, basically have the GLD and SOV and other precious metals ETFs. Remember the derivative trade. So as people buy shares in these ETFs, uh, they then have to go out and source gold from the market. So they get the money in from the share first at a specific price, but then gold could rise between then and when they can actually source it. So they'll take short positions to offset that price risk. And uh, they're, so they're taking short positions to offset that price risk. Um, so, and why they go and get it in the market, and that's why they have these short positions. Well, what's happening on the COMEX is the producer merchants are saying, okay, fine, we'll, we'll release our shorts and we'll go long, and then we're going to stand for some delivery, and the swap dealers then have to produce the gold. So not only do they have to produce the gold for their GLD and, and SLV and ETF funds, but they're going to have to produce it on COMEX as well. So this is pulling a lot of gold out of the swap dealers. The swap dealers are now becoming a conduit for gold, not only going to COMEX, uh, through the COMEX, but also into their funds as more people put more money in there. The managed money are the other financial users and net net, um, you know, they're, they're reducing their position overall. They're reducing their long by 4,400 contracts and they're short by 2148. This tells me that they're going net higher short because they're reducing longs more than short. So they have more short exposure to the gold and silver price. And that tells me that the managed money segment, the financial advisors, hedge funds, people like that are expecting uh, gold to come down because they're releasing more longs than they are shorts. So they're net net higher short than they were before by about almost uh, 2,200 contracts here. And then you have the other reportables, not a whole lot of movement here. They're releasing the shorts here and the other non-reportables. So these, the, the reportables and, and non-reportables, um, you know, are expecting maybe a little bit increase in the gold price, but not much. Net net, it's, it's not much off. The non-reportables are basically even. The reportables are basically uh, net short less about 1700 contracts or more long 1700 contracts and you know that's that's not the big money which is why we don't pay attention to these two categories as much but look at the producer merchants they're asking for delivery in the market um, the, uh, the swap dealers are having to deliver it and the managed money is just sort of saying we're going to actually go more short than we were before because we expect the price to fall. So they're not taking delivery. So it's the producer merchants taking delivery. It's the swap dealers providing it and maybe to a certain extent the managed money, but mostly the swap dealers. That's putting pressure on the swap dealers and that's why we have uh, a short squeeze going on in the gold market. Okay, sorry, back. I had to grab a quick drink of water. So we're now on the silver side of the spreadsheet. And you can see uh, one thing that's similar to gold is that there is a reduction in overall interest, which means a little bit of waning of interest in the silver market. Price is coming down a little bit. We, we showed you that in the charts at the very beginning of the video. 
Now something different is going on in silver. Very interesting. The, the producer merchants, unlike gold, are actually reducing their, uh, increasing their short position. And net net, they're reducing their long. So there's about 2,000 contracts here swing to the short side for the producer merchants when you consider extinguishing the longs and adding to the shorts. The swap dealers are actually decreasing their shorts. So swap dealers are saying, uh, we're getting rid of our shorts. And that's what tells me that um, the, the, the short squeeze in silver may actually be going on right now. Uh, and that's why September is such a big month, because if, they're des if the swap dealers are desperately trying to get out of their short positions, even when they're taking record amounts of inflow into SLV and other derivatives, it means that they feel that they're too short. And the, the fact that producer merchants are going more short, they feel like uh, that the silver price had gotten a little frothy and is likely to come down. So the producer merchants here are betting on a lower silver price. The swap dealers are betting on a higher silver price. So it's the inversion of what's going on in the gold market. So we may already be seeing some signs of short squeeze if there's not enough silver inventory on the market and the swap dealers are desperately trying to get out of the short. We don't really know that. We're gonna to have to see what happens on the COMEX. The managed money overall has greatly increased their long. So the managed money believes they've increased their long by 73.29 or reduced their short by 950. They think the price is going up. So the financial advisors, hedge funds think the price is going up. Uh, other non-reportables is a net reduction in long and short of about 5,000 contracts. So. Some of the big independent players in the market are going short. They think the market's too frothy. So the, uh, the, big, the big independent players and, <clears throat> excuse me, the producer merchants are going the same direction. They expect, the, they expect silver price to go down. Um, the swap dealers are trying to get out of their short position and they expect silver price to go up. So it's a big, big bet going on in silver. And again, silver is more volatile. So you'll see these differences in the different players in the market much more than you will see in gold. And that's why I think September is going to be really interesting as these players really move around their short and long positions. Uh, that means I think we're in for some fireworks in September. Of course, we can't really tell who's going to win between the producers, the managed money and the swap dealers, but we're going to find out. And that's what makes silver so interesting. So I wanted to go over all of this caught data, the commitment of traders data in the gold and silver market to show you what's going on and who's doing what. Now, again, we don't have transactional data as to individual entities we just have it aggregated, you know, up to these to these bigger entities, but at least we can break out who's going long, who's going short with a little bit more detail and determine who may be winning and who may be losing uh, those trades as we go forward. So that's definitely some interesting information there. So that's going to wrap it up for today, guys. I've got a lot more planned and coming as the week goes along. People have been asking really good, timely questions about the series as we go along. So Thursday, we'll have some more nuggets that we'll drop for you that will answer some of those questions. Stay tuned for that. And again, on Sundays, I'm doing the uh, educational uh, part of the series geared toward uh, fundamentals. Uh, we, last week, we did negative interest rates. This upcoming week, I'm going to show you another way to uh, map uh, the increases in price of gold and uh, how you can kind of tell if gold's going to go up or down in the more medium to longer term versus the short term looking at the charts like we've been doing. So stay tuned for that. Hope, guys, this was helpful to you. Till next time, this is Robert Keynes with goldsilverpros.com.